Look like the stream of crowd has slowed to a trickle, so I guess that's time for our cue for the starting time. Uh, good evening. Uh, welcome to our presentation and our service tonight. Uh, good to have you. Glad you braved the, the cold and got out tonight. Uh, we're pleased to welcome Dr. Wade Johnston from Wisconsin Lutheran College to speak to us on Christ will be of no advantage to you. So I'll just turn it over to you, Pastor Johnston. Okay, well, thank you. It gets better from the title on. The, uh, um, thank you for, for having me down. It's, it's been a bit, but I remember fondly filling in in the pulpit sometimes. And uh, in Bible class, I see once I was done, you guys got a fancy new pulpit, uh, the, uh, which is, is very nice. I had to stand in it for a moment, and it seems very pulpity. It seems like it serves well, so that's, that's good to see. Um, if you have uh, Bibles with you, that'll be um, helpful. Um, we'll uh, be looking up some stuff, but I can uh, summarize or read for you as we go. Um, but you might be wondering why the title, Christ will be of no advantage to you. Why would you come to a study saying Christ will be of no benefit to you? Shouldn't we lead with the whole purpose, the whole benefit of doing something? Uh, Christ will be of benefit to you. Christ will be of advantage. Seems like maybe it would make more sense. But what I wanted to build off today um, is this warning that Paul gives to the Galatians. Um, the Galatian congregation were like a lot of Paul's congregations where Paul would come. Uh, he founded the congregation. He ministered to them. And then others would come in. So we know with the Corinthians, there were these he called the uh, the super apostles who come and say what Paul said is great, but there's some more stuff. And they brag about their resume and how great they are. Um, after Paul had founded the congregations in Galatia, which was a region, not a city, so it's a number of cities, uh, this would be a circular letter, there were some who came who were called Judaizers. And what Judaizers were, were people who said, Paul's gospel is great, what Paul preached is great, but there's still aspects of the Old Testament ceremonial law that you need to keep in order to be saved. And if we're thinking of the Old Testament law again, um, we can talk about civil law or civic law, which was for the people of Israel before Christ uh, when they were a theocracy, the only theocracy God has ever called into existence. Um, the ceremonial law for Old Testament temple worship, purification rites, um, ceremonial washings, sacrifices, and then the moral law, which applies to all people for all time. Um, these would be universal laws uh, that you don't even need, usually, the Ten Commandments to know. Uh, Paul says God has written them on our hearts. And the primary ceremonial law that the Judaizers said you still needed to follow uh, in order to be saved to be a Christian, uh, was circumcision, right? Which obviously, um, it's good Paul took the stand he did. That would be terrible for evangelism. Um, if we were trying to require that still today, it would make for a, a very awkward final Bible class, right? When you're explaining, okay, here's what we got to do to join the church. Um, but lest we be too hard on these people, it's important to remember that what they were advocating for was the norm. Um, for centuries, right? The other thing that would come up was dietary rules. Um, could, did you need to eat kosher still? And these would be people who for all their life until Christ had come or they had become Christians, uh, nothing unclean perhaps had touched their lips, right? And so it makes sense that this would be a difficult question for them. And yet Paul will take a, a stance and speak a resounding no to the issue of, do you need to follow any of these ceremonial laws in order to be saved? Uh, we live in a day where probably no one has tried to recently argue you into eating kosher or being circumcised in order to be saved. But we do live in a world awash with law. Um, sometimes we hear people say, there's just, people are lawless now, there's no morality anymore. And I, I always want to object to that because I think all we've done is multiplied laws and traded laws. Uh, I'm less sure what I'm allowed to say anymore now than I was 20 years ago, right? Um, I'm less sure what might get me in trouble now uh, than I was 20 years ago. Uh, we, uh, 
we have to, we, we're on guard um, to make sure uh, we walk the right narrow path, right? We share the right things. We have the right profile pictures if we're on social media. Uh, the, our, our kids today, I always, when I, when I walk around different high schools where my kids have sports, I see more signs with rules and admonitions. Um, I went to public high school, so in the public high schools, I, I see more signs with rules and admonitions than I ever did before. Even in the bathroom, there will be like four or five commandments for using the bathroom. Uh, we live in a world that's still awash with law. And this is a, a problem for us because each of us by nature is tempted to look to that law for our standing with God. Right? Uh, my students sometimes, uh, uh, I'll try to prove th this to them by asking them a simple question. I've probably asked you this in Bible study down here before. And that simple, um, here's the question. Have you been a good Christian this week? Take a moment and think on that. Have you been a good Christian this week? Now I won't put anyone on the spot. But if your mind went to your behavior, you see our natural inclination to turn to the law as our measure of our standing with God. If your mind went to Christ crucified for sinners in whom you place your trust for salvation, well, there maybe we're on a, a little bit better path. It's not that behavior um, doesn't matter, uh, but God is not our divine principle. And the pastor is not called to be the principal's office. The principals are important, they're good, but I remember being terrified of the principal's office, right? To be fair, I went to Catholic grade school and we had Sister Claude Marie, which sounds like a fantastic wrestler name, right? Uh, but, uh, the principal often has to deal with the rules, uh, the handbook. Now, at a Christian school, the principal also gets to share the gospel, right? Um, but God is not our divine taskmaster, nor has he established our relationship with him to be carried out that way. And so when we're tempted to turn to the law, um, doing the right things, belonging to the right parties, um, keeping up appearances right for our family, uh, whatever the situation might be, we're putting our faith at, at risk. Um, the devil gets his nose in the tent. Again, it's a very hard thing to live in the gospel. It's a very hard thing to live in the freedom and joy of the good news of Christ crucified for sinners. And we see this because in almost all of Paul's early letters, he has to write and drive home this point again. And so how arrogant it would be for us to think today that somehow we've moved beyond that. I, I sometimes think of um, our, our students' experiences when they go through our schools, which are, which are a great blessing. But sometimes you talk to students on the back end and... Um, and what they're upset with God about, if they're upset with God, or what they think, you know, was wrong with their education. Uh, almost always, they're never mad at a gracious God. They're mad about the rules, right? Um, and I'm tempted to say, well, did you listen? Because it wasn't just rules, right? Uh, some of us have been there in the classroom where we've spoken the gospel again and again. But the, the rules have a way of getting to people. Uh, if you talk to people uh, who say they are atheists, almost always they're mad at the rules. And they're mad at the God who will judge them based on the rules. Or they're, they're mad at the God whose rules they don't think are fair or are right. Almost never have I had someone say to me, you know, Pastor, I'm really mad at God for forgiving. I'm really mad at God for being merciful. And, and so it's just natural for us to use that as our barometer for our relationship with God to use the law. And so I just say that as caution as we get started so we're not too hard uh, on the Galatians. Paul's hard enough on the Galatians um, and those that Paul ministered to. But if you see your handout, you'll see on the top where the title comes from, from Galatians chapter 5. St. Paul's epistle to, his Galatian, to the Galatians is one of his earliest epistles. First Thessalonians, Second Thessalonians probably come before it. Um, but already in the early to mid-50s, Paul is writing to the Galatians, um, to these congregations. And so we see one of the first controversies 
that will arise in the churches. And um, the early, the first four chapters are largely doctrinal. They're dealing with teaching. Five and six will sh uh, shift to practice or uh, application. Paul does this with all his letters at some point. Ephesians 5 is the transition point in Ephesians. Romans 12 and Romans, right? He, because Romans, he hammers doctrine for quite a while. Um, but in Galatians 5, we see this transition point. And so Paul, who has spent four chapters driving home our freedom in Christ, uh, freedom from sin, from death, even freedom from the law. Luther is just fun on Galatians with this. Sometimes I like to have my students read. I give them a section from Luther's commentary on Galatians and don't tell them who said it. And sometimes, some of them get convinced he must, this must be some false teacher um, because Luther drives home just how much we're free from the law as a standard for our relationship before God. Um, and so this is the big transition point, and you, you see on the top there, um, and I'll read just briefly for you. For freedom, Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. Um, I think the maddest I ever was at catechism kids in the parish. Um, I had a group of all boys. Uh, it was great most of the time. Um, if they were acting up, I made them go to the gym and they ran suicides or whatever we're supposed to call that now. They were all in the sports, so it was, it was okay. They ran it, they were happy. Sometimes I just go, run some laps, come back when you're tired. Well, one day they just had not been focusing, and so I gave them a passage. I said, I'm going to walk out of here for five minutes. When I come back, you're going to tell me what this passage is about. And I came back, and they, they said, it's about eggs. And I was ready to lose it. How do you think this passage is about eggs? Well, it talked about a yoke. Turns out they haven't been plowing with oxen lately, right? What is, what is a yoke? A yoke is a, is a heavy um, piece of, uh, um, of hardware that you lay on a bigger animal to get it to go where you want it to go. Um, and that, that yoke is heavy, and that yoke takes away your freedom. You're now directed by another. Uh, sin then and work righteousness are a yoke. They're both heavy and they take away freedom. We are now bound by that, directed by, by that. So he continues, verse 2, Look, I, Paul, say to you that if you accept circumcision, Christ will be of no advantage to you. I testify again to every man who accepts circumcision that he is obligated to keep the whole law. For you are severed from Christ, you who would be justified by the law. You have fallen away from grace. For through the Spirit, by faith, we ourselves eagerly await the hope of righteousness. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything, but only faith working itself through love. I was talking to our, our new colleague today. You guys will get to know him. His wife's been called down here to be one of your teachers, and I'm sure she'll do a great job. Um, but he was talking about, in his class, he had been uh, teaching about Genesis and Abraham and circumcision. He had come up, and he said he, uh, he had said to the class, what is up with God being so concerned about circumcision? Why would God be so concerned with this part of the body? Is he just weird? And one of his students said, yes. Right? Um, someone who is newer to Christianity in the church. And this this by all accounts, seems like a weird thing, isn't it? Um, this concern with, with circumcision. Why in the world would God, of all things, be concerned with this? Um, and then why in the New Testament would there be debate, debates about continuing it? Um, but if we, we won't read in Genesis 15 and 17, but it's there for you to look at later. If we consider um, the establishment of the covenant with Israel and then how it was marked, as a reminder for the people, will understand why circumcision became so important, and rightly so. Right? Now, Paul does a marvelous thing in Romans and Galatians, though. Um, for those who would say that Abraham was the father of the Jews and the father of a two-way covenant of law, Paul makes a pretty um, straightforward argument. He says, what came first? The promise or circumcision? And so when you get home this week, if you're bored, if you read Genesis 15 and 17, they're very interesting chapters, you'll see that in Genesis 15, God forms his covenant with Abram. He's still Abram at this point. 
And he has these animals that are, are cut in half. Um, and this is where we get cut a deal from, right? And as Abram falls into a deep sleep, um, God appears and there's this uh, torch and a smoking pot. Not, not Illinois style. Um, and, uh, and it goes through these animals that have been cut in half. This was, the one who walks through is saying, if this deal isn't kept, the punishment's on me. I'm the one who has to pay the price. God cuts the deal. God walks through and makes a, a covenant with Abram, a one-way covenant that he will have offspring like the sand right on the, on the beach, like the stars in the sky, and most important, that the Messiah, the offspring, the seed, capital S, would come from his line. And in Genesis 15 then, verse 6, if I'm remembering, the Bible says, Abram believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. In other words, Abraham was saved the same way you are, through faith. Abram believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. And then God himself walks through and cuts the deal, this one-way promise, and if anyone should break this covenant, it would be on God, and so who pays the price? But Christ himself, who we'll see appear right as the angel of the Lord with the sacrificing of Isaac, where it's driven home to Abraham that a, 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 a substitute will come for him. It's only in Genesis 17 then, that Abraham is now given the name Abraham. Anybody remember what Abraham means? Avraham. Av, Abba, Father, Raham, many. Abraham becomes the father of many. The promise is reiterated. And then as a sign of the promise, circumcision is instituted. And circumcision was to be a reminder to every Jewish couple that the Messiah would come from their line. Now, we live in a day and age where we tend to uh, um, be, be very clothed around each other, right? Um, I think maybe uh, I was the tail end of you had gym class and you had to take a shower, and in a fashion that probably kids today would be shocked at, it was just one big group shower, and you should deal with it, right? Um, for much of history, uh, you didn't have... Uh, bathrooms where you just went in individual bathrooms and, and closed the door. You went to an area and people, right, could be observant. I have European friends that when they come to America, one of the things they comment on is our stalls have the little slits in them that theoretically you could see through if you wanted to. And they'll be like, what's up with that? You, you, you guys look at each other? I'm like, why would you want to? No. But, you know, it, when we lived in the Netherlands, there's, there's not the slits. They, they, the stall just closes. This is your private area. Um, when they would go to the gymnasium um, and they were going to get their exercise and it was all uh, men, right? Um, people would have seen each other and asked, what, what happened to you? Right? And this would have been a, a, a catechetical moment. And not a moment to primarily say, oh, it's because I eat kosher. Or it's because I do this purification right. It would be a moment to say it's because the Messiah will come from our people. It was, it was meant to be a reminder that Christ would come. So it makes sense that they would cherish that, right? This, this sign of the coming of the Messiah. And, and that God would deliver the Messiah like he delivers all good things to us through means. How does he come to you with, with bread and wine, with water? How does he feed you through people and their vocations? And so also the Savior would come through Mary, right? He would be true God, but also true man. Um, he would be of the Jewish people. And so this was a very important reminder that the Jews would have, but it was a reminder of gospel. It was not how one should be right with, with God. Now, God did take it seriously. There's sometimes where the Jews neglected it, and it didn't go well, right? But that's how seriously God takes his promise. The same as sometimes when we lose sight of Christ, um, God allows us uh, to be reminded of that, perhaps even uh, through affliction or suffering sometimes, that our own power isn't necessarily 
quite sufficient always. Uh, St. Paul had his thorn in the flesh as well. And so in Galatians 3, 1 through 9 there, um, if you want to flip there, you can. Otherwise, I will flip and read it for us. Uh, Oops. Should have brought my bigger print Bible. My eyes are getting not as good as they used to be. The, uh, but Paul is speaking to the Galatians, and uh, it's always fun when we're in Pauline epistles. One of the questions for each class is, how is the opening to this letter, how would you describe its tone? And Galatians is the main one where students are like, he seems angry. And he is. And Paul probably dictated most of his letters, and he signs them at the end and notes what big letters he uses. And I just picture him pacing and pacing and pacing as poor Silas or whoever is trying to, uh, to keep up. And so Paul says, O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? It was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. That was Paul's preaching. Let me ask you only this. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Are you so foolish Having begun by the Spirit, are you now perfected by the flesh? Did you suffer so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? Does he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you do so by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Just as Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. No, uh, then that is, excuse me, Know then that it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. And that's the passage I want us to especially pay attention to. Right? He's not just the father of one ethnic people. He's the father of all who have faith. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, And you shall all the nations be blessed. So then, those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. I, uh, I had a chapel sermon once, and it was the most feedback I've ever gotten on a, a chapel sermon. And the refrain of it was, God does not need your foreskin. Right? Apparently it even made its way to Wisco, and I remember my boys complaining about people talking about it. Um, apparently it's not cool to have people reference your dad in that way. Um, but, but God in the New Testament, God in the Gospel does not need your foreskin. God wants your ear. Right? I joked about um, Sister Claude Marie. My dad has a story back when he was at school at St. Mike's, and um, you know, sometimes we'll joke that our nuns were super nice compared. And, and uh, he, he apparently had zoned out one day, and he wasn't quite listening. And she grabbed him by the ear, and she walked him over to the window, you know those old school windows in school that would kind of just fold open? And he, she stuck his head out, she said, Johnny, can you hear me now? And that's what God says to us again and again. Right? How does faith come? Paul says it comes through hearing. God wants your ear so that you can hear the promise. What's the only thing you can do with the promise? You can trust it or not trust it. You can try to help it along, but that usually does more harm than good. In many ways, the Old Testament is people trying to help the promise along again and again. Abram and, uh, Abraham and Sarah famously try to help it along. And he, she says, Has it, have, a, uh, have a child with my maidservant Hagar, right? And then he does, and she gets mad. And that's marriage, right? Um, but uh, God says, this is not the son of the promise. This, Paul will say in Galatians, this is a sign of the law. Isaac would be given entirely by promise. Now, you can try to hold someone to a promise, and that's, that's how you learn to pray as a child. Uh, when you were a parent, you might recall this. You gave your child a promise, and uh, they just pestered you for the next week, two weeks, three weeks. You know, we'll, I pro Okay, we'll go to Cobb sometime and get custard. But when did your child think sometime should be? Yeah, and so each day, um, they not only asked, they sometimes commanded you to do this, which is what Jesus teaches us to do in the Lord's Prayer. We don't ask, give us this day our daily bread. We tell him, 
you said you would do it. And as a child, you honestly believed your parents would, and so you kept telling them to do so. A promise can only be received through faith. And Abraham was a son of promise. And all who received the promise through faith are children of Abraham. And then in one of my favorite church festivals of the, of the year, um, the, uh, uh, correct me, Mike, it's January 1st, right? Not the 31st. Circumcision of our Lord in the name of Jesus. Uh, I, have, I won't go on my New Year's Eve thing, but uh, where Jesus is brought to the temple, what do we see take place? Uh, not only is Jesus circumcised on the eighth day, uh, which is Luke 2.21, um, Jesus as a child first already is shedding blood for you. Um, in fulfillment of the, the old covenant, he is circumcised. But he's also given a name, lest we be confused about how salvation comes. He's circumcised, but he's given the name Jesus. One of my favorite prayers is by a theologian named Johann Gerhardt. And he wrote systematic theology, dogmatic works, and he wrote devotional works. And I really like his devotional works and the systematic stuff. It's okay if you can't sleep, right? Um, but in one of his devotions, he has the prayer, Jesus be Jesus for me. Fantastic prayer. If I remember when I'm dying, I'm going to say that, right? Uh, if I'm like, no, I'm dying. Maybe I'll just pass in my sleep and uh, that'll be it. My wife will, right? Wade, wake up, shake me. Be hilarious, right? <clears throat> I'll just be there. Um, but if I know... Jesus be Jesus for me. Why is that such a great prayer? Jesus has given this name, and do you remember what this name means? We shall call him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Jesus be Jesus. Jesus is circumcised in keeping with that ceremonial law, but he who will fulfill it is then given a name that says, this law will be fulfilled for you. Right? You will be saved by grace and through faith. Um, and that those two are tied together, I think, is a very important thing. If we uh, get to then, Christ will be of no advantage. We've talked about the Galatians and the Judaizers. But I just want to talk a little bit briefly about capital L law and small l law. Sometimes people will argue, all Paul was talking about in Galatians was capital L law. He's just talking about the Old Testament law. Surely other law can play into our salvation Right? We can have, uh, it's not that he's rejecting all works, but just the works of the Old Testament ceremonial law, and that's really hard to hold up if you read Paul's epistles. Right? But capital uh, L law would be the Old Testament ceremonial law. And we know Paul has that in mind, partly at least, because uh, when Peter comes to visit the Galatians, Peter, who had been getting along just fine with the Gentiles, you might recall in Acts, Peter has a vision of animals coming down on a blanket, and he's told, kill and eat, uh, which to him is shocking, because some of these are unclean animals. Right? Uh, Peter, who knew better, withdrew from the Gentiles when some of these Judaizers came. And Paul rebuked him. And Peter showed great faith, because you know what Peter did. He accepted the rebuke. He was wrong. And Paul says, Peter, you and I know as Jews that the law was a yoke we ourselves couldn't carry. Why would we put that on the Gentiles as well? This Old Testament law that had been turned into, was not always intended to be, but had been turned into a measure for one standing for God, was, was too much to keep. It was, it, was, it was too much to stand up under. And so Peter accepts that rebuke. Um, and we can see more of that unpacked in, in Galatians 2. And yet, why that law exists, Paul will make sure, uh, certain for us. So you can flip if you want, otherwise I'll just read. But from Galatians 3, 19 through 29. I had my marker here and then I moved it. But uh, in writing to the Galatians now, we had earlier in chapter 3, he's going to build upon his argument and beginning with 19, he has this question, then, why then the law? And here, um, this could be uh, the Mosaic law, but it can be law in general, because this is, this is why laws still get made today, you'll see. Why then the law? It was added because of transgressions. Why do we have to pass new laws? Because people keep doing things in new ways, right? 
The internet comes along, got to have new laws because people find ways to break laws on the internet. Um, someone gets burnt spilling coffee on themselves. They're shocked it's hot. We have to pass a law that coffee cups have to say coffee is hot. Right? This is why laws still... Get... Parents know you had to come up with some rules in your house that probably would have seemed super weird to anyone else, but your kids needed those rules, right, for whatever the, the temptation might have been. Um, so why then the law? It was added because of transgressions until the offspring should come to whom the promise had been made, and it was put in place through angels by an intermediary. So Sinai, right? Mount Sinai was a scary place where the law was given, and it was meant to be a scary place. Even the beast that touches it shall die, and yet who could be scared of Golgotha? where God hung weak on a cross. Now an intermediary, intermediary implies more than one, but God is one. Is the law then contrary to the promises of God? Certainly not, and note this, for if a law had been given that could give life, then righteousness would indeed be by the law. Why can't the law give life, by the way? Theoretically, the law could give life, but it can't give life to who? Who doesn't qualify Sinners, and I heard a rumor that we might have a room full of them, right? It can't give life to us. Um, but the scripture imprisoned everything under sin for our own good. It said, this is all under sin, so that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. Now, before faith came, we were held captive under the law, imprisoned until the coming faith would be revealed. So then, the law was our guardian until Christ came, in order that we might be justified by faith. Justified means, again, what? Anybody remember? It's a courtroom word. Declared not guilty. Notice it's something God speaks. Just as he spoke creation into being, let there be light. Just as he spoke peace be upon you when he appeared to his frightened disciples, he declares us uh, not guilty. But now that faith has come, we are no longer un under a guardian. For in Christ Jesus you are all sons of God through faith. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is no male and female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, then you are, notice again, Abraham's offspring. Heirs according to the promise. And the picture there is in the ancient world... Um, you had a, a slave society. Now, it wasn't the same as we think of a slave society in America. It wasn't racial. Um, race had to wait centuries. Race is an Enlightenment concept. Um, one of the many gifts the Enlightenment gave us, like the guillotine. Right? We're going to cut off heads, but we're going to do it in a very reasonable fashion. My, one of my favorite news stories was a, a guy uh, in the Detroit area where I grew up had been building a guillotine in the woods. Can you imagine? All this effort he put into building a guillotine so he could kill himself. And they found him right before he could use it. And they dissembled his guillotine. And I think, what a neat moment. They saved that guy's life, right? Um, but what a ton of lot of work, right, to go into building a guillotine. Well, the Enlightenment gives us race conceptions. Um, they wouldn't have had that in the ancient world. They would have known people were from different areas, but they wouldn't have known, uh, they wouldn't have thought of it in, 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 racial, uh, um, in racial ways. Uh, slaves were people maybe who sold themselves into slavery for a while for economic reasons, were taken as captives and prisoners of war, had been left out as children um, for exposure and picked up. Um, they had chances often of, of gaining their freedom through manumission. Um, but you often had very educated slaves, and we, didn't, we don't think of that in the American setting, but slaves who were doctors or philosophers or teachers. Um, one of the famous Stoics, Epictetus, is sent by his master to be trained in philosophy. Well, uh, slaves often would be the tutor of the son who was going to be the heir of everything, of the free son. And for a while then, the free son, who was going to be that slave's boss someday, had to listen to that slave. But when the time came that he came of age, he was now free. 
And the same is true for uh, the history of God's people with the law. The Israelites were under the Old Testament for a while, but then the, the son was of age, Christ came. And now we're saved by grace and, and through faith, and that tutor, that guardian, does not have the role that it once had to, uh, to guard and hedge off Israel uh, so that the Messiah could come through them. And so, yes, Paul's talking about the capital L Mosaic Law. Uh, but I think the small L law, it's important to keep in mind too, and here, um, just a book I've been jumping to more and more lately, a fun book if you're, um, it's probably a good one for, to do with other people because it gets a little, a little uh, weighty at times, a little deep. Um, but it's St. Paul's letter to the Colossians. The Colossian congregation, Colossae is a, um, a congregation that Paul didn't found. And he likely never went there. It was founded by... Um, a man named Epaphras probably. And Epaphras had, had come and met Paul and told him about this congregation. Um, but this congregation was having some issues. There were some who had come and, and they were bringing Greek philosophical concepts into the congregation. And Greek religious ideas. Things like asceticism. Um, giving up certain things. Um, denying yourself certain things. Or ritualism. Observing certain days. And secret knowledge. Um, and this was definitely something that was from the Greeks. This was a Gentile thing. This was not coming from, uh, from former Jews. And so Paul's going to write to the Colossians. And in Colossians 2, uh, this is what he's going to have to, to say, lest we think this is just the Old Testament law uh, that's being talked about. I should have marked this one off. The, uh... So Colossians 2 pick up with verse 8 if you're there otherwise I will simply read uh, therefore as you received Christ Jesus the Lord so walk in him uh, by the way the Lord Jesus Christ right um, I remember once hearing a pastor say yeah my people get Jesus as their savior but not that he's their Lord what, is, what does Lord mean in the New Testament Kyrios Kyrie eleison, Lord, have mercy. Lord means Savior. So your Lord, your Savior, and Savior, Jesus, he who saves, Savior, Christ, the anointed Savior. This is when your pastor says to you in the blessing after communion, now may your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, now may your Savior, 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 Savior. You think he's maybe trying to drive home a point? And, and yet we, we can easily miss these things. And so Paul is driving this home uh, as well. Therefore, as you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. This was my first sermon text in seminary. And it, Paul did a great job with it, but it pains me to read it because that was a dog of a sermon, but I must have preached it like 20 times. And God's people pretended it wasn't that bad, right? It's a, God bless them. Rooted and built up in him and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit, according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, just how people tend to think of things, and not according to Christ. For in him the whole fullness of the deity dwells bodily, and you have been filled in him, who is the head of all rule and authority. In him also you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands, by putting off the body of the flesh. And when Paul says flesh in the Bible, it means those things you're able to do by natural powers, which are limited things. What can we do by our own natural powers? Well, we can sin and we can do some decent stuff, but we, we, can't, we can't be righteous. Right, So the flesh is limited by the fall in, in, into uh, sin. Um, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God, who raised him from the dead. And you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, and whenever we want to add the law to salvation, we should remember Paul loves to call sinners apart from faith dead. And what did dead people do? I dare you next time you go to a visitation, go up front and say, hey, Bob, get up. Well, go to your favorite restaurant. 
What do dead people do? There's one thing they do. They stay dead, right? But you were dead in trespasses. Oh, well, what does God do? He raises us. And the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him. How does he do that? Having forgiven all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt. What's that? The law. That it stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. So here Paul's talking to a Greek or Gentile congregation and saying the same applies for all the stuff you might hear from the Greeks or Gentiles. All their law too, their elemental spirits, their philosophies, their platforms, their movements, their advertisements and promises, their expectations, their cultural norms. All this, too, is not how you find you're standing with God. No, you've received a, a better circumcision, right? All these Greek Gentile things boil down to the same thing the Jews were doing with circumcision by adding law where there was no room for it. He says, now you have something better. You have baptism, and I should have checked before. Well, it's not going to apply here. But in many old churches, um, baptismal fonts had eight sides. One of the reasons they had eight sides is the child in the Old Testament was circumcised on the eighth day. And baptism is now superseded circumcision. A, everybody gets baptized. It's not just for, for one group. Um, B, it's not only a sign of the promise that we will be saved, but it gives salvation. And it gives it as gift, right? Sometimes people get worked up about infant baptism, but is there any better picture for salvation than infant baptism? It's not like the kid crawls up. The kid doesn't say, Pastor, I would like to be baptized. Like the paralytic who is brought by Jesus, the, the child is brought by friends and family to the Messiah. Sometimes the kid even sleeps through it. Right? Parents are usually disappointed by that. Um, but that's at least better. Parents sometimes feel especially bad if the kid fights it. I always loved when the kid cried and fought baptism. It's the old Adam. Is there any better image? And it still got wet, right? It still poured the water on the child's head. And it's given salvation entirely as gift. That child literally has nothing to offer God at that point other than future potential, perhaps, I suppose. Um, but God's not playing the market, right? He's, he's not investing for down the road. Um, and so Paul uses this picture of baptism and a circumcision done not, not by hands to talk about now um, our sign, our seal of salvation is entirely gift and it's given to us in the gospel through the good news. Which brings me to one of our, my favorite passages in scripture, which should not be, but I've never been, um, or have seldom been accused of uh, maturity. So... I have there the first part from Galatians 5, 1 through 6 what, that we've read. Uh, but I've mentioned Paul dictating his letter perhaps. So he's marching back and forth. He's upset with his beloved Galatian congregations uh, that he had founded, that have been brought to faith through their preaching. And so easily they're falling astray now, uh, falling away, following these Judaizers who come obsessed with circumcision, making it part of salvation. And in Galatians 5.12, Paul says, I wish those who unsettle you would emasculate themselves. If they're so worried about part of it, I wish they would just cut the whole thing off. And I picture Paul dictating this. Silas or whoever kind of stopping and saying, uh, Are you sure you want that in there? This is going to be that Bible thing, right? The, uh, someone might read that in church. You ever, do, you ever get those Bible passages, pastor reads, and church gets real quiet? Seems like it shouldn't be in there. Paul wanted it in there. And Paul's not doing something so strange. The Matthew 5 there, you don't have to flip to. But Jesus says, if your eye causes you to sin, do what? Pluck it out. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. Now there we get it. That's law. We're sinning. Sinning's bad. We shouldn't sin. 
If the law causes you to lose sight of Christ, cut it out. That's not what it was given for. If you thinking you have to live up to God, that you somehow can make yourself right with him by finally being good enough, if you think God loves you so little that you have to dot all the I's and cross the T's for that to happen, cut it out. What an insult to God's love. If your child came to you and, uh, and they showed you their report card and they had done well, and they said, Mom or Dad, do you love me now? Wouldn't your heart break? What had you done wrong? Do you love me now? Well, that's what we do when we let the devil get our ear. And he tries to convince us that, that anything we can do can separate us from the love of God. That God's grace is not greater than, than our sin. And that's not let's go intentionally sin. That's always the worry people have. Well, people might go intentionally sin. Yes, they'll totally stop sinning otherwise. We've only been around for thousands of years. Remember that time when people stopped sinning? If the law causes you to lose sight of Christ, cut it out. And the problem's not the law. It's that you're asking the law to do what the law was not given to do, to determine your standing with God. Abraham was called to faith, then circumcision was given. Do you love me now? Nope, I loved you from the moment I knew you. And God says the same to us. And we're just a twinkle in our parents' eyes. He knew you, and he chose you, and he called you through preaching, and he brought you to faith, and he said, you are my child. And what you began in that way is the same way, hopefully, we will close our eyes in death, in Christ cross before our eyes. So, um, the final passage is there, and I think we're probably getting it about time. Uh, but Paul reminds the, the Colossians then that they are free, and that they are free in Christ who is all in all. He's everything. He's enough. And Paul then talks about now this new freedom we have, and he says something kind of odd, and so I just want to hit on it. This is his Baptismal chapter, Romans 6. Uh, the more I think about it, I think the two teachings that Lutheranism has that are just... Lutheranism's stamp is on it, and it sets Lutheranism apart. It would be vocation and baptism. Um, and you have someone who talks very well about vocation who preaches down here, which is a, is a blessing. But Romans 6, 20 to 23, Paul says, For when you were slaves of sin... You were free in regard to righteousness. You could do anything but be righteous. Isn't that great? But what fruit were you getting at that time from the things of which you are now ashamed? For the end of those, uh, um, excuse me, for the end of those things is death. But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, it doesn't that sound terrible? Slaves of God. Have you ever hear an account of someone whose life is saved by someone and they say, wherever you go, I want to be with you. The fruit you, ha you get leads to sanctification and its end, eternal life. For the wages of sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. I had to stop doing it in class um, because I got complaints from the people who had the room next to me. But I, I used to tell the students in 110, I shouldn't be so proud of myself for this. Um, I'd say, uh, if you want an afterlife you get credit for, there is one for you, but the Yelp reviews aren't good. And then I'd pretend on my computer to read the Yelp reviews. And I'd just scream. Because it's hell, get it? People scream in hell, right? There's not great reviews. But the good thing is, if you're cool with getting one as gift, there is a great one for you. Uh, and it's the gift of God, not by the law, but by the gospel. Um, so you're not, as Paul will say in Colossians, you can look up later as you are, you're not any longer what you were, according to the law. You are what you are according to the gospel in Christ. You are what you are according to gift. And Paul says, be what you are. But then he warns in Colossians 3, and I know I've talked about this down here before because I remember it. 
in that room, and we had a good discussion. Um, he says this life is now hidden in Christ. Sometimes you're going to feel like, look like something that you're not. Sometimes it can be pretty hard for you to believe you're a child of God. But that's what you are. It's sometimes hidden. It's an article of faith as well. But as certain as it is that Christ hung on a tree, so it is that certain that that is what you are. And, and you're not going to get any better by thinking that's not what you are. Faith working itself through love, Paul says at the end of our initial lesson here, right? Faith working itself out through love. Gift then leads to gift. Um, so, you want to do it by law? Okay, but Christ will be of no advantage to you. The law is no buffet, right? If you're like me, you go to the buffet, what do you do? I don't know how often you go to the buffet, but I think of old country buffet back in the day. Uh, you get a little bit of salad just for appearances, right? Um, but that's not going to be your main focus. Drench it in dressing and undo any good you're trying to do, right? But then you're going to pick a lot of what you like and none of what you don't. If we want to go the way of the law, it's not a buffet. It's dinner when mom said you'll eat what we made. I remember my dad once staying up um, for hours with my brother who refused. I believe it was spaghetti. And it was like, it was like a cold war. It was a stalemate. Um, you know, this, was, this is like a... Biden and Putin staring each other down right now. Uh, that's what the law is like. James says, right, you've got to keep the whole thing. If you break even one bit, then you've committed a crime, you're a criminal. But that's not what the gospel is. And so by grace and through faith, through the preaching and the sacraments you find here, Christ is of advantage to you. And the good news is it's not just a buffet, but a feast, as Jesus likes to, uh, to picture it. I don't know what's served, fish or something fancy, um, but a feast instead. So with that, I will stop talking because I know Pastor Borland is supposed to lead us in Compline, and I went uh, two minutes over, so I owe you two minutes, but I'll, I'll live in grace and consider that all right. So You saw him walk out on you, huh? Yeah, and then he, he gets to sit in the anxious bench <laughs> He up does, here, huh? yeah, yeah. This is a, like the bishop's throne, huh? You, <laughs> that he feels powerful in this. <laughs> All right, I will gather my stuff, and I thank you for having me, and uh, we will have compliments. Thank you. Let's give him our...